Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown. I am super excited that you guys have joined us. I am joined by Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick, my good friends who are ready to uh, do a little bit of calculus with us this evening. Steve's got some great problems lined up for us to uh, look at um, in regards to the topic of rectilinear motion. And then Tom's got some great... Uh, technology tips on both the TI-84 and TI-Inspire technologies. And so we're looking forward to that tonight. Um, but Steve, would you go ahead, I guess, and uh, kick us off here? All righty, you betcha. I'm going to share my screen here. Coming up one second. Here we go. Let's give that a try. How's that, Curtis? Okay? That looks fantastic. Okay. Well, thanks again, Curtis, for arranging all of this. It's a delight to work with you and Tom. And uh, even though the football season is over, Monday Night Calculus is still in season. That's right. We're still right? in calculus <laughs> season. We're rolling along. So tonight we're going to talk about rectilinear or what I like to call particle motion problems. Yes. And, you know, it, it seems to me that in an AP calculus course, students see bits and pieces of particle motion throughout the course. As they learn some new concepts, we often go back and say, oh, well, let's look at another particle motion problem and, and add this new idea. So what we're going to try to do tonight is pull together all of these concepts, put them together in one place. So we have lots to do. And I'm going to start by looking at a lot of terminology and a lot of interpretation. So let me see if I can get down here to page two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to interpret some common phrases that we see in a lot of AP calculus questions. And I'm going to try to interpret them into mathematics. And then eventually I'm going to solve a couple of problems. After that, I'm going to get to the exercises that we assigned for tonight. And then eventually I'll hand it over to, uh, to Tom. And Curtis, please let me know if there are any questions that come up. And I have a couple too here. Absolutely. As Steve mentions there really quick, Steve, before you get started, sure. um, I do want to encourage everyone to make sure that you post your questions into the uh, chat and, and give us good discussion there. We've got a lot of things we can talk about there. And if you are looking for the uh, assignment that Steve is talking about, the exercises that he has given, uh, we post those in a bulletin board blog on the TI website. You can always go and access those there. I would highly encourage you to use those with your students or even better, uh, assign them to them and then have them come and attend these, uh, these Monday night calculus sessions um, and ask their questions uh, at those times. I think that would be a really great way uh, to get your students involved in, in learning uh, a little bit from, from someone else maybe a little bit and, and getting a, a different perspective on, on some things. I think that's always a good uh, a good thing. So hopefully this is a useful resource in that way too. Okay, thanks Curtis. So let's start out by supposing we have a particle uh, moving along a horizontal line. So that its position at time t for t greater than or equal to zero is given by s of t. This is kind of standard notation. We usually use s of t to represent uh, the position at time t and v of t to represent the velocity and a of t to represent the acceleration of the particle. So I'm gonna kind of give some brief uh, interpretations now of some phrases that we might find in some problems. So one common phrase that we see of course is initial position. And the initial position generally means s of zero. And of course the initial velocity would be, well, what's the velocity at zero, v of zero, and the initial acceleration. Now I'm gonna scribble off to the side here. Generally in the AP calculus exam, they're very careful about uh, giving initial positions because for example, what happens if we describe the motion of, of a particle, whoops, sorry about that. And we say something like, well, uh, this motion of the particle is described for t greater than or equal to two. Well, now what's the initial position? It would probably be, well, s of two equal to some value. So I don't think you'd ever see a problem on an AP calculus exam where they try to, I don't wanna use the word trick you, 
but they're a little bit more subtle where they say the motion of this particle starts at t equal two. So the initial position is five. And so you'd have to know that S of two is five. I think they'd let you know that. Generally, the initial position is S of zero. All right, well, the position of a particle at a specific time, that's a common phrase we see in these problems. And that's just translated into mathematics as S of T sub one is my specific time is some value S sub one. We often have questions where we have to find values of T at which the particle is at rest. Well, that means we have to find those places where the velocity is zero. And that means we have to solve this expression V of T equals zero. This has been kind of a common problem in the technology section where students have to find these values of T that satisfy that equation using their calculator. Four and five, I'm gonna sort of look at together here. So we often see phrases like, well, when is the particle moving to the right? Or when is the particle moving to the left? And this is interpreted in terms of velocity. So wherever the velocity is greater than zero, the particle is moving to the right. Wherever the velocity is less than zero, the particle is moving to the left. And often these are, these are times that we have to find in problems too. find all those times when the particle is moving to the right, for example. Uh, six is uh, the average velocity of the particle over an interval, let's say A to B. Well, there are a couple of interpretations of this one, Curtis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just draw a little arrow here. This expression right here is really just the average value of a function. And that function happens to be velocity. And that's how we might interpret this phrase. I mean, another way to interpret this is if you look at the end here, is this is just the distance traveled in the numerator divided by the elapsed time in the denominator. And that of course is just the average velocity of the particle over that interval. I think there's a great amount of sense that can be made out of that last uh, version of that there. That's right super here? helpful. In, yep. Yes, in understanding uh, in understanding the question, the average velocity over some interval, it's, it seems very reasonable. Certainly to does. The, the average velocity by uh, doing what you're showing on the, on the right-hand side, um, for sure. sure. It seems very understandable. And I apologize, Curtis, there are equal signs here. And yep. I just want to remind you that that S of T is an antiderivative of the velocity. Yes. And so these are, those are three separate expressions that are indeed equal. Mm -hmm. um, number seven, sometimes we have to find the instantaneous velocity of the particle at time at a specific time. Well, that's just V interpreted, or pardon me, uh, evaluated at T sub one. That's the derivative, of course, of the position function. Oh, there's more. Yep, you're right. <laughs> there's lots of these. <laughs> Sometimes we have to find the acceleration of the particle at a specific time. Well, that's okay. We need to find or evaluate A at T sub one. That's the first derivative of the velocity. That's the second derivative of the position function. And I'm gonna kind of combine as I did before, I'm gonna kind of combine nine and 10. Sometimes we need to find where the velocity of the particle is increasing or where it's decreasing. And how do we interpret that? Well, I, maybe I should have covered up the A's here, but just thinking about a traditional sort of function, F, where is it increasing? Well, where its derivative is greater than zero. So that's where V prime is greater than zero or the acceleration is greater than zero. And the particle, the velocity of the particle is decreasing where the velocity, pardon me, where the derivative of the velocity is negative. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky, I think, here after number 10, the speed of the particle. The speed of the particle is the absolute value of the velocity. See if I can get this right here. Velocity is kind of like, in, in my mind, a vector. Mm -hmm. It has both magnitude and direction. Yep. But the speed of the particle is really just like a scalar. It's just a number. It's the absolute value of the velocity evaluated at a specific time. And so 12 and 13 are some very common questions that we see on the exam, questions involving the speed of a particle. 
So when is the particle speeding up? Uh, well, the particle, uh, the speed of the particle is increasing bluntly when the acceleration and the velocity have the same sign. So either they're both positive or they're both negative. Now, I've also put in an or here, and this was kind of an aha moment for me, Tom. A couple of years ago, I saw this on a, uh, actually on a free response portion of the exam, grading the exams. And it was a technology active question. And a student had actually, instead of finding values of A and V, had actually found the derivative, numerical derivative of the absolute value of the velocity and I think it was positive and said, well, the particle, uh, the speed of the particle is increasing. And that is a correct way to do it. Now, you might just think about this. This is just a little bit of a challenge. And I've got a couple of those tonight, Curtis. How would you do something like this? How would you evaluate that derivative if you had to do it by hand? That's a mm. good question. It is a good question. Okay. So the particle is slowing down. We often get a question like that. When is the, or is the particle slowing down at a specific time? And that would be where the acceleration and the velocity, of course, have different signs. And similarly, we can look at the numerical derivative. I'm gonna say numerical derivative of the speed. And if it's less than zero, then the particle is slowing down. Yep, there's more. Um, we often are, some of our students often get 14 and 15 uh, confused, mixed up. Uh, there was a question a couple of years ago that asked for both of these, total distance traveled and displacement, I believe in, the, in a, uh, different parts of a problem. So the total distance traveled by a particle over a time interval A to B is the integral from A to B of the absolute value of E of T, the integral of the speed actually. Now, generally, Generally, these types of problems are asked on a technology active portion of the exam, but here's another sort of a question or challenge, Curtis. How do you solve that problem? How do you do that if you had to do it by hand? What would happen if that kind of a question or you had to find the total distance traveled? I'm gonna turn that to the audience and let them okay. maybe, uh, maybe put that out there. I'm gonna ask the audience on that one. All right, let's uh, leave that out there. That's see a good if we question. Can, see if we can get a get a response back from the audience on. Okay, very what good. Are they, what do they think? What would be the method that they might choose? Yep. What's I know the I initial have it method? Mind, but I'm I don't think I'm right. So <laughs> okay. All right, the displacement of the particle, or another way to say this is the net distance traveled over an interval A to B is just the integral of the velocity. So note the difference between fourteen and fifteen. The displacement of the particle is just, well, how far does it move? What's its displacement over that interval? Where was it at time A? Where was it at time B? And what's that difference? In 16, uh, we're often asked for the position of a particle at a second time, say T2, given the position at T1. And this is very common on the AP calculus exam, that expression. And at least Curtis, in my mind, this is, an actual, this is actually an application of the fundamental theorem of calculus, I think part two. And uh, I, very common on the exam, very common. 17, uh, when does the particle change direction? Well, this occurs where the velocity of the particle changes from positive to negative or vice versa, negative to positive. We're often asked questions about that. You know, find all the times t in an interval where the particle changes direction. And then in number eighteen, I think this is my last one, Curtis. Particle, when can we find a place where the particle is farthest to the right or farthest to the left? Well, in my mind, this is a, a this is an absolute maximum or minimum question. This is an extreme value question. And I generally solve these with a table of values method. Now, of course, there are other methods to find absolute maxes and mins, but that's the way that I interpret that number 18, okay? For sure. All right, well, let's try one. Let's see what we can do with this one. Uh, this one, we certainly need technology. Here we have a particle moving along a horizontal line. We'll take a look at the time interval, just zero to eight, and take a look at that velocity function, if you would, for a minute. Um, I probably overdid it here, but the point I'm trying to make is this is really, uh, this is meant to discourage students from trying to integrate that expression. 
Um, yeah, they could probably find the derivative by hand, but this is uh, clearly a technology active question. The posi position of the particle is given by S of T, and we know the initial value, we know the initial position, it's at negative two along this horizontal line. So I've got now four questions here. A is find the values of T for which the speed of the particle, the speed of the particle is one. So I'm gonna get back to B, C, and D here, Curtis, but let me work on these one at a time and I'm gonna use technology here. I hope you can see my screenshots. There I are can. a couple of ways. There are a couple of ways I think I could do this with the calculator. Uh, I'm gonna show you one. Uh, Tom probably has some more uh, clever ways to do this. What I really need to do is I need to solve this expression on this interval zero to six. I need to find all those values of T where the absolute value is equal to, the absolute value of the velocity is one. Now, one way to do this is to draw the velocity function, and that's what I did. And I found the points where it intersects the line, the horizontal line, one and minus one. I don't know, I, I found it, I think more, uh, illustrative for me, better for me to understand if I drew the velocity function rather than the absolute value. But of course, drawing the absolute value of V works also. So on the graph screen, I found these two values of T. And I think those are rounded. So at 3.991 and 4.511, the speed of this particle is one. And I wanted to show you this on the uh, uh, calculator page or on a calculator page. Uh, I know Tom kids me about this all the time, but I always explore on the calculator page, but confirm on the calculator, uh, uh, pardon me, explore on the graph page, but confirm on the calculator page. And this is, I think, a really nice application of the TI Inspire. I've defined this function V. I'm gonna solve this expression for T. And it's kind of hard to see, but there is that such that, that vertical bar in there. Give me those values of T only between zero and six, and there they are. And that's pretty cool. That's really cool. That is really a nice uh, I think nice a example of the way that that works. Yep. Um, and I, and you know I what? am I'm... with you, Steve, on the visualization yes. first. <laughs> Explore okay. graphically. I, yep. I have Confirm to li that. I live and die by that graph. Yep, uh, I'm with you. Very good. All right, in part B, if I'm reading this correctly, we need to write an expression involving an integral that gives the position of S of T, very common, gives the position of the particle, I'm sorry, at time T. And then we want to use this uh, expression to find the position of the particle at five. So, okay, we know that the position of the particle is given by this expression. A uh, minor point, subtle point here, Curtis, you'll notice that my variable in here is x, different from this t, because this is a function of t. The t right. x in my mind are serving or functioning in two different ways. And all I did in this next step was plug in that s of zero. So if I want to find the position of the particle at time t equal five, I just plug in that zero, uh, pardon me, that t equal five, I did this integration on a calculator page. There it is. So it's at seven point, I guess, seven, two, three. I generally round up a little bit, okay? Well, that's interesting because that's a question that I would have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I mean, it, okay. on the AP exam, that would be acceptable to give that to seven uh, seven point seven two two. also, correct? That is correct. I could truncate that. Yep, we take both rounded and truncated. Good okay. question. And I just wanted to check this or see this graphically. So what I did is I graphed over here on the right-hand side, I graphed the velocity function. And we know we have to integrate under that curve from zero to five. And there's my answer, 9.723. You'll notice that that's, I have to subtract two from that because all I did really on that graph screen was find that indefinite interval. So I feel pretty confident about my answer, okay? Very good, part C. C was find all the times in this interval for which the particle changes direction. 
Okay, well, that means I have to find first, start out by finding places where the velocity is zero. And then I need to see whether or not the velocity changes sign at those two places. So I started out on the graph screen over here on the left hand side. I drew the velocity function and I used the features of uh, on this graph screen to find these two values t equal 4.26. And Curtis, I'm going to say 6.26. Two seven. Well, you know, I would round probably there and say 6.271. That's not what I wrote here. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Okay. Mm, okay. So I found those two values where the velocity crosses the X axis or the T axis. So velocity is changing sign. It, it is because over here it's positive over here. It's negative, And then it's negative to positive. So that indeed does mean here that the particle is changing direction at those two values. But right. let's look at this for a second, Curtis, over here on a calculator page. So I did the same thing over here on a calculator page and let's see if I've got this right. I'm, I'm focusing in here for a second, Curtis, if I can on this second value right here. 6.27046. Yeah. If I stop at my calculator page, uh, pardon me, my graph page, and I look at this value, and you and I just talked a minute ago about rounding and truncating, and my preference is to round, as it is for a lot of students and teachers. So yeah. if I look at that on the graph page and I round and I say, okay, well, T must be equal to 6.271, I'm going to argue that that would not get credit on the AP calculus exam. And the reason is because the value really over here to five digits to the right of the decimal. So you've got a, you've really got a double rounding kind of happening there. If you're There's something really yeah. weird. Yeah. Because if you round this value, it's 6.270, right? Uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, an but if you here. round it to four decimal places, it's uh, 6.2705. Right. Which is what you're showing over here on the calculator screen. Correct. And so if I'm going to argue that if a student just solved this problem by looking at their graph screen, I think they would get this problem wrong, that answer wrong. Now, the truth is uh, the uh, discussion about this came up several years ago, I remember at the AP calculus reading, and I, I don't remember the exact context, but I think it was, it, it was certainly in regard to rounding, uh, rounding issue like this. And I'd like to think that I was smart enough to come up with this problem so that I could illustrate this issue, but this is just pure dumb luck. And so I think what happens, Curtis, is that when the development committee gets together to assemble these problems, they make sure that something like this does not happen. Because certainly this would be very unfair if a student solved this on the graph screen and wrote 6.271 when that's not quite right here, rounded, looking at a calculator page. Right. So that really, I think that's a very interesting issue and problem. Uh, it might come up and it's good discussion in a class, but boy, I hope that doesn't come up uh, on the AP exam. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. And the last one is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing, I think was at time t equals six. So, all right, I have to find v of six and a of six. That's my naive way to do this. I already have this function v, I think in my calculator, I evaluated it. Um, and let's see, I have to find the acceleration at t equals six. So in calculator lingo here, I'm taking the derivative of the velocity and I'm evaluating that at six, these signs are different and therefore the speed of the particle is decreasing. Let me just make a remark here as you're getting close to preparing for the exam here. If a student reports these values, they must be correct, correct up to three digits to the right of the decimal. Unless the problem actually asks for those values, 
In general, the student does not have to report them. So a test taking strategy is to find those two values and to simply say, oh, well, V of six is less than zero and A of six is greater than zero. So you don't risk a copy error. You don't risk writing one of those decimal values wrong. And now you can say, all right, because those values, uh, because the signs are different, the speed of the particle is decreasing at t equals six. So Steve, two questions on that. Well, sure. two questions, one related to this and one related to the problem before, and I forgot to ask it. Okay. Uh, is the assumption here then just being made that um, a student has in fact verified that? Um, or do I have to give some sort of um, you know, proof that I have verified that V of six is in fact less than zero. That is always, it's always a good question, Curtis. You know, the student could just simply be guessing, you know, and, and, and be lucky. Uh, but unless the problem specifically asks for those values, in general, you do not have to report them. You just start being uh, kind of, uh, yeah, so they can, they really can just write down what they what they think might be true. Okay, so on that note, then yeah. um, I, I would like to ask one question related to part C. I think it's is it C? Okay. Uh, can I back you up just a little bit here? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and you had solved this on the calculator page on one point six there. Yeah. Um, what what if? <laughs> A, a student, how would a student be able to um, answer that question if they had only done it on the calculator page? I, I think they might struggle to say that it changes sign without having ever looked at the graph. Is that correct? Or is there something else I could do on that calculator page? I mean, I, I suppose I could evaluate it just to the right and just to the left of each of those and kind of give myself a, a picture there. But wouldn't I need to do the graph page pretty much there? The graph page certainly gives you a better illustration of what's going on, Curtis. But my response to your question is, well, uh, you know, a student can create a sign chart. Now, remember, a sign chart is not sufficient justification, but they could certainly create one here where t is equal to 0, 4.25, 6.27, and I think 8 was the last value. Right. You know that the velocity is 0 here and 0 here and figure out the signs with test values as you just... Yeah, that's what I... Yeah, okay. So some sort yeah. of testing uh, test values or something like that would also be sufficient um, to, go, to get me what I needed there. Okay. Now, remember that this sort of a picture is not enough. The student still needs to... Uh, write an, a, a, an expression. They still need to write a phrase here. A phrase, interpret, okay. Interpret that sign chart. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah good, good questions, Curtis. Very good, good questions. And just to finish up this problem here, here's the numerical derivative of the absolute value of the velocity. It's a negative. Hmm, that's interesting, but true. And that means, again, that's an alternative method to show that the speed of the particle is decreasing at that time. So cool question, very standard sort of, I think, AP calculus questions. I'm going to try one more here, Curtis. I don't know if I'm going to have time for the exercises, but I think this is a good one. I need to do this. Um, have you ever been to, uh, to Disney World, Curtis? I have been to Disney World. Okay. Is it Universal or which one has, has the Tower of Terror? Have you ever done that? I believe that's at, I, I think that might be in Disney uh but I don't know which park. Okay, well, here, this, this problem is based on the Tower of Terror. Somebody will comment and tell Somebody us. Somebody will tell us. <laughs> so there is actually something called the Power Tower at an amusement park in Minneapolis or near Minneapolis. And it is one of the tallest, I believe, amusement park drop towers. And you get a series or a sequence of these turbo lifts and drops, kind of like- Oh, yeah. I rode one of those on the top of the uh, stratosphere in Las Vegas. It's called the Big Shot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. You want to talk about- That's scary <laughs> there. <laughs> All right. Well, let's suppose that the velocity of this power tower ride is modeled by this piecewise linear function shown in this figure. And T is measured in seconds and V is in feet per seconds, okay? Okay. So there it is. 
So I have a series of questions here. I have three of them that I'm going to look at, and I, I'm going to leave D for our uh, listeners here. And we'll, we'll get to that. That's right expressions for the ride's acceleration, velocity, and distance from the ground that are valid in this interval 7 to 23. Okay, so okay. we're going to leave that one. I'm not going to do that one. It says, at what time intervals, at what times, I'm sorry, in the interval 0 to 39, does the ride change direction? Well, all right. There's the graph once again of this uh, velocity function. And it's a concept very similar to one that we just looked at. This is the velocity, where is it zero? Well, here, here, here. All right, well, where does it change direction where the sign of the velocity changes? So at those first three values, kind of hard to see on my grid, but indeed that does occur at 7, 13 and 23 seconds not at 32, okay? Because the velocity right. does not change direction there. Okay, let's see, in part B, what were we doing? At, the, at what time in that interval is the ride highest? Okay, well, that's a max-min problem, okay? And for me, I attack these in a very, uh, I guess, systematic sort of way. I'm gonna find all those places where the velocity is zero, all those places where the velocity does not exist, I'm gonna find the critical values of S of T and I'm gonna create a table of values, okay? So let's see, where is V of T equal to zero? Well, it's equal to zero <laughs> at seven, 13, 23, and 31. Are there any places where the velocity does not exist? Well, be careful here. There's a lot of sharp edges in this graph, but remember, those would be places where the derivative of the velocity does not exist, but there are no holes here in this velocity function. So right. it indeed does exist for all values between zero and 39. So this means to me, Curtis, what I need to do is I need to evaluate the pardon me, the position at each of those values and the endpoints. Now, this is a very systematic and I think safe way to solve this problem. Now, you're right, Curtis. I know you're going to ask me this. You're right. It is possible that we can rule out maybe one of two of these because we might know that it's at a local minimum and that's perfectly acceptable but I tend to just evaluate at all of these places. And it turns out that in this problem, all, a lot of those evaluations are gonna be, I think, very helpful. So here we go to the next page. At a local minimum? We may have a local minimum, right? Where would that occur? It wasn't, is, aren't we looking for where it was the highest? Yes, but if we had a local minimum, we might be able to eliminate that value of T. Ah, okay, if, okay, if thank you. Have, we wouldn't have to, <laughs> we wouldn't have to find that value in my table here. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So my picture might get a little messy here, but let's see. At t equals zero, the position of the object is at zero. How do I know that? Well, let's see. What's the, what was that uh, expression for S of t? I'm going to scribble a little bit down at the bottom. S of t here is going to be S of zero plus the definite integral from zero to t of v of x dx. We know that this ride starts out, okay, right at ground level at zero, okay? All right. All right. So at seven, let's see. I have to actually integrate zero to t of this velocity function. So that means I need to find the area underneath that curve from zero to seven. Curtis, quick question. How would you do that geometrically? So I would use a trapezoid. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I was Excellent. just recognizing this is a pretty, you don't have to have any real uh, calculus uh, like integration skill here. You just need to know that you need the area underneath of that thing, right? I think there's some great concepts going on, but you're right. You don't have to actually do any uh, symbolic. Side note here, Steve, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm distracted here. Uh, we got a comment from Jordan that said that the inventor of these rides got the idea from playing with his newborn. Uh, <laughs> he wanted to lift, make a ride that was like lifting the baby up and down, but then just a little more thrill involved. Um, <laughs> a little for, more, for a little people, more thrill. Okay, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool. 
Well, you're absolutely right. I think you could do this with a trapezoidal rule, Curtis, no question about it. But you know what? I think a lot of our students actually break this up into, can you see the two triangles on the end? Two kind of skinny triangles in there, one there. I do. I see uh, two triangles there. And in fact, that's a nice, um, maybe even easier way to do it, right? You, it kind of makes a little bit more sense in the context of the situation too. Yep. There you go. All right, so that's actually how I did it. And I found the height of the ride was 270 feet. And then at T equal to 13, let's see, we've got to take that 270, we've got to subtract this area because while well, the velocity is below the T axis. So let's see, right. it's moving down. So we got to subtract that. So there's the 270, that's the height after seven seconds. And I think that's a triangle. I, that's one half the base times the height. So now after 13 seconds, it's at 90. All right, then from 13 to 23, it's going up a little bit. There we go. I added in that area. It's at 240. Now it's going down. It kind of stops for a split second and goes down some more. At 31 seconds, it's at 80 feet. And then finally, it ends up where it started at zero. That took a lot of doing, by the way, Curtis, to make sure it ended up back where it started. I was just going to say, <laughs> I, one really great question that popped into my mind was, did it actually return to where it started? <laughs> it um, did. It did. <laughs> I thought that would be an interesting question. And, and we're getting some good... Um, Good comments from Alejandro on the on the chat here talking about making sure that you remember your area formulas and those things. They actually yep. come into play here. Um, you have to remember that piece. So um, good on you, Alejandro. This is exactly how I would have worked it too. Very good. So the question I think was in part B, uh, something about, well, what was the highest that the ride attained? What was, and I think it is indeed 270 feet. And that occurs at t equals seven seconds. Which makes um, some sense if you've ever ridden one of those. Yes, uh, yeah, they take you up to the highest point they first. They definitely okay. get you to the highest point first. Yep. I think if I remember correctly, Curtis, in the Tower of Terror, when they put you out there, I think they bring you up a little bit first, if I read correctly. Oh, yeah. Right? So there's oh. actually some positive uh, motion there, positive velocity. Very oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. That one's a more of a fall ride, right? You sure. Just, you just fall. Well, there is, there's actually a sequence of uh, drops and lifts. Oh, okay. okay. If I read correctly, it's actually uh, random. There's supposed to be four random drops and lifts oh, with wow. the first one being the, the farthest. And let's see down here in C, I think, let's see, where are we going? There we go. C, I asked for, let's see, I think I asked for this. Oh, find the total distance traveled by the yeah. ride mm -hmm. during the time interval zero to 39. So for that one, we have to find the integral of the absolute value of the velocity. Well, okay, there's the velocity uh, function, there's the graph. And really, instead of subtracting these areas, I simply have to add them in this time. And so the total distance traveled by this object, by this ride is 840 feet. Beautiful. That's really a nice uh, one to show how you using those parts kind of uh, subsequently. That was, that's really well I like that. Well done. Now, one mm -hmm. thing I did not put in here is I, I made this velocity uh, function a sequence of straight line segments. But of course, you know, you might be able to make this a little bit different with maybe a semicircle or something. And we have seen problems where there's actually been a uh, part of a parabola in there for the velocity. Yeah, I was going to say a parabola might be a really nice uh, part of this problem. Either. So in that case, Curtis, in that case, you might have to do some symbolic integration. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. OK? All right, well, let me just say in part D, uh, that's the challenge where we ask people to find uh, some symbolic representations uh, of some of these functions. And as an aside, you know, sometimes students see problems like this. And one of the things they try to do is they actually try to find it in a symbolic expression for the velocity. And boy, that would, you know, it's certainly possible you can find expressions for these straight lines. But boy, that's in general, that's a waste of time on, a, on this exam. For so sure. I would, I would not recommend that at all. 
Now, our two problems or two exercises that we assign, Curtis, are pretty long, and I know I'm running kind of long. Can I turn it over to Tom here? Because I know he's got some good technology stuff. Okay. I think that would be a good idea, Tom. I'll let you get ready um, to share. And, okay. and there we go. Okay. Uh, take it away, Tom. All right. I'll, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm actually going to try to use both uh, PI84 and PI Inspire tonight. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll start out with the 84. So let me share my screen there. And you all can give me some feedback if that's working okay. Yep, it looks yep. Uh, looks good. Great. So, so I'll apologize in advance if I'm going over stuff that people have seen before. But, um, but I did want to point out there's some really nice things you can do with technology uh, besides calculation and graphs of uh, these functions, like Steve has shown, is the technology actually allows you to see the motion as it's taking place if you set it up correctly. And that's, I think, just incredibly cool. So um, I think this is really valuable what you're going to show here for students. Go, you can go ahead and get it started. Okay. Uh, I, it's just so valuable to be able to um, help visualize what Steve is showing. I mean, we, we're all pretty, I, I suppose we might be familiar with the the uh, elevator uh, type ride there um, and, and kind of seeing that. So that's maybe helpful in the visualizing, but I don't know, me personally, I'm not very familiar with uh, particles that just happen to be floating back and <laughs> forth on, on a line. Uh, that just is a little more difficult for me to visualize, so. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm gonna go to the Y equals menu and this is what we usually see on the, when we're using graphing calculators, handhelds, is most of our work is done plotting uh, functions. And so this is our usual y equals menu. Uh, I'm going to actually change the mode and go to parametric. So I'm going to arrow down here to parametric, hit enter. And now I'll go back to the y equals screen. And you can see I've actually gone ahead and entered some things parametrically. Now, folks tend to think of parametric as that's actually motion where you're moving around in a plane, not along just a single straight line. But there's no reason we can't use the parametric to go along a straight line. And not only that, is you can set it up so you simultaneously see the motion along a straight line and the graph of the position function. And so that's what I've done here is I'm doing the motion along a vertical line. And I'm gonna say as a teacher, um, these rectilinear motion problems, they tend to either be on a horizontal line or a vertical line. And I like to start with a vertical line because it's easier to make the connection between what's going on with the graph. Yes. The graph is meshing position is going to be the Y coordinate on any graph. And so if your motion's vertical, then there's uh, an, an easier translation. Of course, you should do both, but I like to start out with vertical. And so yeah. what I've done is I've set up two sets of parametric equations. One of them, I've just made the X coordinate constant, negative one. And then this is gonna, the Y is my actual vertical position. And you can see, I, I just made up a function three times the cosine of I T over two. Now, my second pair of functions, now my x2 t is actually t. So I'm going to let it actually be a function of time. So I'll actually see the, the same position function, see y2 is the same as y1, but I'm going to see it as a graph over time. So I'm going to see both the motion on the line and the graph of the position function. And this I is like kind that. of a way to see that. Hey, I'm going to go to the, hey, oh, go ahead, Curtis or Steve, either one. Tom, um, and maybe I'm stealing your thunder here, but uh, before you leave this page, um, 
are you going, are you thinking you're going to come back and talk about the graph style here or you want to do that now? I was and talk going about... to just show kind of what happens, but then come back to the graph style. Okay, cool. Uh, I won't steal your thunder then. Oh, well, that's fine. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what to do at the graph style? So I was just going to ask that you change the, um, so if you arrow to the, uh, arrow to the left okay. and you see the, um, and that all the way over to the left there where you got the color and the line type and wow. press enter there to select that. Um, and you can change both the color, which is fine, but more importantly, the line style, um, you can change that line style through a number of things. And this one right here with the ball and a tracer uh, behind it, I, I think is incredibly useful. Maybe not so much for this first one um, because you really are, that is just the motion. You just kind of want that one. So you can actually um, move that one one more um, and not have the tracer behind it. So it doesn't leave okay. that line uh, and you just see the ball motion on that one. Okay. Uh, and then say, okay. All right. Yeah. And uh, then do the same thing for the uh, for the position uh, one. And in this case, you might want the ball uh, and the actual uh, the, the tracer behind it. Trace the graph. OK, mm -hmm. that's great. All right, let's do that. And I'm going to leave it as a different color. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great I think idea. I'm going to uh, have a ball that the, that little segment there is indicating what Curtis was talking about. It's actually going to uh, leave a trail behind. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's important. Yeah. So I really like this. Okay. And now the next thing I'm going to do is actually look at the window. Uh, and this is something if, if you've done most of your graphing with the Y equals menu for functions, this may be a little surprising is uh, besides the X min, X max, Y min, Y max that we're used to, that's our window. We also have a T min, T max, because this is functions of time. I'm gonna go ahead, it says T min uh, zero. I'm gonna make the T max, uh, let me go ahead and make that 10. Uh, and you can see I've, I've, I've gone ahead and kind of preset this window. I've set my X min to negative 2.6 to 10.6. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is kind of what you usually would get with a zoom decimal window. So I think we're, we're ready to roll here and um, it's time to graph. So you see that ball going up and down. And now this is the graph <laughs> of the actual position function. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's see if I wanted both of those. Let's see, should I have done... Uh, should have done uh, simultaneous, yes. I forgot to check that when you're in the mood. Ah, I have sequential. Yeah, we wanted that to be simultaneous. So what we saw there was the motion of the, if it was a ball, what a particle, some, some object that was moving up and down on a vertical line. Uh, and then we saw the position graph plotted. But now I'm going to have those go simultaneous. And let's re-graph. Oh, I love this. <laughs> See how it coordinates the red dot and the blue dot are always at the same height because that's what you're, you're actually plotting is the vertical position of that, that dot. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that helps in, in incredibly. And I know on a, on a Zoom meeting or, or uh, you know, some other things, sometimes the, the uh, video isn't always together with that, but I encourage anyone who has the, that technology, try what uh, Tom just did there. Um, and you'll see what we're talking about, just how visual that really that connection between uh, the position of that uh, of that ball and the and the actual um, position graph and seeing those two kind of work together um, is very powerful. I want to make one more quick change here. I'm actually going to go ahead and change that uh, graph style on the actual motion of the ball uh, to leave a line also. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's re graph again. Now, once it's gone over that line once, it's going 
you can see it going back and forth. But um, sure, mm -hmm. so there we can see kind of what was the the line that it was traveling on the whole time. Right. Um, and I won't do it here. Sometimes there are questions where you actually have two two objects moving on a, the a line and. It may be the same line, but if you want to distinguish between the two, you notice I've got x equal negative two over here. We could have a second particle moving along that line. You can yeah. pass them going in parallel. So uh, as I said, uh, I do this with horizontal lines too, uh, but to, as, a, and as an intro, I find vertical line is a nice one to, to do. Tom, before you leave this page, sure. is it instructive at all to, to just quickly show uh, the trace feature here? Absolutely, yeah. So that's one where we can, as we trace, we can, I'm going to, as I use the right arrow, it's actually moving time forward. Now, I had the T-step set at 0 0.2, so it's incrementing time by 0.2 seconds or 2.2 minutes, whatever my time unit is. And if I switch graphs, it's giving me that corresponding point on the actual graph of the position as a function of time. Now, if there was something uh, specific, Steve, you wanted to take a look at here, we could. Yeah, I, I think if you would, Tom, just go back, switch back to the blue graph for a second. Okay, sure, there we go. And so here's a question for our listeners. We don't, I, I, we're not gonna give an answer for this one, but trace just a little bit along that line for a minute. Tell me when to stop. Stop. Okay. So here's what's happening. What I see, maybe I'm wrong, but the increment of T, of course, is constant. Right. However, that object jumps a greater distance at certain times. Mm. Ah. Ben. So <laughs> why is that? That's a great question. Yeah. I'm looking forward I mean, to I'm not, seeing Naively, you think, well, you know, T is the same increment all the time. That little crosshair ought to be moving the same increment up and down, but it clearly is not. Yeah. And I think there's a visualization there. I think there's a nice concept there. Yeah. I think there's a great yeah. concept there. And um, it, it helps tremendously being able to use that trace feature to kind of slow things down a little bit, to be able to, to watch that and see the, the increments be larger jumps and smaller jumps. And why, yeah. Also I, where you see it jumping the, the greatest, if we go over to the other graph. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, you might. Yeah, yep. Now you can say, well, yep. now you can say Ooh. here that's giving us a clue as to what's going on there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's just a wonderful environment. I, you know, I think this really, for, for me, teaching uh, rectilinear motion and the, the advent of graphing technology, where you could actually see the motion in action was revolutionary to me. It's a teaching tool. Yeah, sure. for sure. So, so we've just got a little bit of time. I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch platforms here. Just give people a glimpse of a, a kind of special TI Inspire file. So I'm gonna first do a stop share, but then share again, but it gives me a chance to switch over to um, a TI Inspire file. And I'm gonna kind of give an unabashed plug here. This is a resource that one can find over on Calculus Inspired. Uh, and that's just a set of, of activities and uh, TN, TNS or TI Inspire files uh, that you can use in calculus teaching. Uh, and this one is, is one of my favorites. Um, it's uh, elevator height as an integral of a velocity really going to be reminiscent of the example Steve did of the power tower. Okay, so what we've got here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and advance the page. Uh, what we have here, this is a piecewise linear graph of the velocity of an elevator. So I'm giving you the velocity graph. 
not, not the, and I think that's what Steve had in his example was he was actually showing a piecewise linear graph of the velocity of the power tower. Yep. Now, over here is actually a rendition of the of an elevator that's going to follow this velocity. Its movement will be depicted by this velocity graph. So you can ask yourself, will the elevator start out moving up or down? Well, let's look over here at the velocity. It looks like the velocity starts out being one, positive one. So that means this elevator should move up. I agree. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like, well, what's going on here? Well, the velocity is going down, but it's still positive. So you want to think about what does that mean in terms of the position of the elevator? Well, it should be still going up, but slowing down. And then where the velocity changes sign, this, that's where the elevator will change direction and start moving down. So a lot of that reasoning, but now we can actually play it out. I'm going to increment time. Let's see if that elevator starts moving up. It's that red dot there. And when my velocity graph crosses, it starts moving down. And just like Steve's questions before is how fast is it actually moving? And I'm trying to click there at a fairly constant rate. So that's, that's making the time increment in, in a fairly constant rate. So equal increments. Now, if we wanna see an actual graph of the position, this is the position graph that went with that velocity graph. Uh, I think, and if you want to see both of them simultaneously, there they are. So this is the position. And some people look at this and say, oh, wow, look at that. It's very smooth. <laughs> but it should be because it's differentiable. Even though the velocity graph has these sharp corners in it, it's continuous. It exists over that whole interval. So the position function should be smooth. What I really love about this uh, file is you can change the velocity graph uh, on the fly and it will instantly update the position graph. That's fantastic. I hope that's showing up. What a great, that's a really nice visual, Tom. Um, and uh, while you're showing that, while you're kind of uh, have that up on the screen, so this file that you pulled here is just one of many. There's a pretty large library that we've uh, posted. I think the link was put up in the chat here. If it, if it wasn't, it, it is just a, uh, in just a second, we'll put up there, uh, is our math inspired series of, of uh, materials. It's you know, a wide range of things there, but you can specifically grab the calculus uh, suite of them. Um, and there's a whole bunch of calculus files ready uh, to go on um, our math inspired and 84 central for 84 files. There's also a series of calculus files um, that are demonstrative like this um, on the 84 um, and, and show some of these similar topics. Um, and Tom, it's a uh, it's about 6.58 or 7.58, yeah, so I want to be real careful we don't overrun. Turn it back over. Okay. Um, and I did have one more piece here that I want to make sure that I plug, um, and that is that uh, Steve and Tom, you guys have been working on a project for TI for a number of years um, called TI in Focus. Um, and um, we have, have really really appreciated your expertise on this. Um, and just for our, our audience out there, I wanna make sure that I, I put this out there as well. There's a, a page called um, TI in Focus. And if you go to the education.ti.com uh, website and look underneath of the resources tab, you'll see a, uh, a, resources, a resource called TI in Focus. Um, and this is a, a series of videos that Steve and Tom have pulled together. Um, looking at uh, old free response questions. So questions from previous years up through uh, 2020, as a matter of fact, we've done this uh, for about four years, I guess. 
um, we've done this and looked at uh, the, the previous year's free response questions, um, both in a scoring context, in a uh, context of, of, well, what were the questions that they could have asked by this STEM and didn't? Um, what are some technology extensions that what could have been used um, to teach this topic or to explore this topic deeper? Um, and then Tom also makes some great videos uh, on just how to uh, use the calculator, both in learning and, and teaching uh, those topics. And then Steve's got some other videos in there, um, just a little bit more similar to what tonight was with uh, uh, some content and, and just real content learning uh, involved in there. It's a very rich resource, and I want to make sure that uh, people are aware uh, of that resource. So we'll, uh, we'll make another plug for this and another Monday night calculus. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we got that out there. Um, with that, uh, I think this, uh, it's seven o'clock now my time, which means it's uh, <laughs> probably time for us to sign off for the evening. So um, I greatly appreciate everyone who is uh, attending these live. And again, I just make a plug for getting your students involved and having them uh, sign up and, and, and watch these uh, on YouTube live and ask their questions. Uh, thank you very much for the evening and we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Good night. Thanks Curtis. <laughs>